How many Thomas Kane books have you written? Three novels and four novellas. Uh, two of those novellas I co-wrote actually with another author. Uh, and there's a fourth book uh, that has not been published yet um, that's with an agent who, uh, you, I think you asked about this before, but he's considering, you know, he's shopping it around. We're considering maybe signing with a publisher and seeing, you know, what that might mean and what, what might be out there on that avenue. So what is that, four or four? It's about eight, eight Thomas Kane books. And why haven't you tired of this character yet? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I think, I think part of it, I think, is because I did keep his past mysterious. So there's always something else to reveal. You know, I, like, I think if I had, one of the things I wanted to avoid was that I saw in a lot of thrillers, what I call like the resume, you know, where they'd be like, oh, we're going to bring in this guy and he's ex special forces and he served five years in Libya. And, you know, they kind of go down as the whole thing. And to me, that kind of takes the mysticism out, it takes something away from it because, I sort of feel like, well, if the only thing that's special about him is that he's a Navy SEAL who did these things, then any Navy SEAL who did those things is the same. You know, it's sort of, so I, I wanted to kind of avoid filling in like every little detail. And, I, and, and by doing that, I think it allows me to kind of find new angles and new things that, you know, I find interesting about him because there is a, a big black space, you know, in the background. So his, his background is, is a mystery. All we know is that he was betrayed uh, at, at a certain point in his life, but is he a mystery to himself or, or you don't go that far into his mm. thought? Well, I, you know, I try to go a little bit into his thoughts, but not too much because I feel like, in fact, I originally, when I first conceived the series, one thing I did change was I originally was going to write it first person where you would hear his thoughts. And I realized, I was like, well, if I do that, then I feel like I'm giving too much away because you're always going to know you know what he's thinking. So a lot of times, so I switched it to third person. And a lot of times when someone asks him a direct, you know, really probing question, I'll have him just like look at the person and not answer. And I try to let the reader kind of project what they think the answer might be, you know, onto it. Um, I, so I, I really do make a concerted effort to as much without, you know, without sacrificing character and making him someone believable and someone you can invest yourself in, I make a concerted effort to keep as much of him in the dark as possible, you know, so that, because I think that that allows the reader to inject a little of themselves and their opinions and their beliefs, you know, into his character. Well, why is he doing this? You know, I, sort of like as an example, in that first, the first book, Tokyo Black, he's, uh, he is sort of driven to help this girl. And he's, it's never really explained why, you know, he sees a picture of her and he just, kind of from the very beginning is inclined to help this girl. And I remember the editor kept saying, you know, I don't understand, like, why does he want to help this girl so much? Why does he want to help this girl so much? And to me, maybe this was wrong, but I just felt like if I went and spelled it out, that would sort of cheapen it. You know, I was like, I don't know. He just feels this compulsion, you know. But by leaving it open, that's what I made the novella about. So in the novella that, you know, that I gave away for free, it's sort of outlined this experience. And I don't directly connect the dots, but you could read the novella and say, oh, well, maybe that's why he might be inclined to help this person. Because here in this story, he didn't help a person in a similar predicament. And this is what happened. You know, so you could make that connection or not, you know. So that's sort of the way I try to handle that. When you write a spy thriller, does the protagonist really change? It's tricky. You know, I, I don't think the protagonist has to change per se, but I do think some, I think there's two ways you can go and I've done both. I think they can change like in one area or in some area or the world around them can change. Um, I think, you know, like a character like James Bond, for example, changes very little throughout the books, but the world around him changes. You know, he stops things from happening or he, I mean, really, most heroic fiction is about reasserting the status quo, right? Like something has gone awry and it's up to the air to set things right. Um, and I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, there's a million books and movies that, you know, does Indiana Jones really change, you know, between those movies? I, I don't think he does, but they're perfectly entertaining. So I don't think it's a requirement. But I do think when you're writing, it's certainly more interesting on the writer's side. And I think this might kind of go down to like what you're saying about the reader's expectation and the writer's expectation. I don't think the reader expects your hero to change necessarily book to book. But as a writer, I think it's more fun if you can sort of inject a little bit of change. And so 
where that's why over the course of the first three books, like I mentioned in the fourth book, he's back to working with the CIA. And the, the course of those first three books is sort of about that change, about him slowly kind of coming in from the cold and learning how to trust again and, you know, kind of rebuilding his life in essence. And to coming in from the cold, so from being sort of this outlier, this like fringe character, and now being in this structured environment where he's totally watched. Yeah. Probably has, has to that, and also I think sort of believing in himself, you know, be believing that he can actually make a difference and do something good, you know, because he starts off very bitter and angry at himself, like I said, for the things he's done in the past. And there's a part of him that honestly believes, like, if I get involved with these people, I'm just going to make it worse for them. You know, like just nothing good comes from me. You know, I mean, and so I think he's gradually kind of lifting himself out of that. I mean, he sort of starts out, you know, a little bit of kind of self pity. You know, I mean, he's he's living off the grid. He's kind of operating as a petty criminal and just kind of surviving. And so there's sort of this theme in the first book about you know surviving versus living. You know, he's not really living. He's just surviving. Um, so little things like that, but I but they're not drastic changes. I mean, he's certainly consistent, you know, throughout the four books. And I that to me that's enough to keep it interesting for me. And I don't think the readers really want him to, you know, suddenly, you know, wake up and be a totally different person or have a huge, you know, come to Jesus kind of thing. I don't think that's what readers of that genre are looking for. Okay, true or false mm -hmm. question here. All major characters have strong motives and that their own journeys aren't always in alignment with any other character? All right, let's do, let's break that up into two. So all major characters have strong motives. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'd feel uncomfortable saying all anything. I mean, like I said, I don't think there's rules and I'm sure there's great stories that might not pop into my head where they don't have strong motives. Uh, maybe like, uh, Dazed and Confused, that's a great movie. I don't know, I'd have to see it again, but I don't know if I'd say they have really strong motives. I think it's on, that movie's almost about them sort of finding a motive, like by the time they get to the end, you know. Um, but I think that certainly most characters tend to, and, and I think it's probably easier to construct a compelling story around someone that has a really strong motive versus someone who doesn't. Like for example, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know, I mean, that guy is obsessed. Like, his entire life revolves around figuring out, like, what happened and getting to this point, you know, and he can't even explain why, but he's willing to give up, you know, his family and his job and everything. Like, that, that, I think it's, I think it's easier to construct that kind of story than someone who's just kind of ambling along. And then the second part is um, that their own journeys aren't always in alignment with any other character. Sure, I'd say that's true. I mean, because that's flexible, right? It says aren't always. So maybe they are, but they certainly don't have to be. How do you keep track of your characters and all of their motives? You know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't really have a hard time with it. I know some people make, uh, you know, charts like Excel sheets. Um, like if you read a lot of books on outlining, say to, uh, you know, for each scene, you always want to write down like the main character and what their goals are for the scene. I find for whatever reason, that just isn't an issue for me. Like I tend to know what the character's motives are. I just, it's, maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's just how I kind of come up with the scenes from in the first place, but I've never really had a problem with that. Like it's just sort of in my head. How important is that first opening page? I think it's certainly important. I think people, I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on your style. I mean, I think some people really want that amazing sentence that just hooks you. I, I'll be honest, I don't tend to write that way. I don't tend to have that. Usually, I think my openings are more kind of uh, setting a place and kind of drawing you in, you know. Um, I think one way or the other, you need to interest a reader, but I think there's lots of different ways of doing that. So, I think, again, you just have to find what works for you, you know. But I think if you read my books, I don't think you would, like, read the first sentence of any of them and be like, that's an amazing first sentence, you know. I, I think uh, that just isn't the, isn't my style. Okay, so it's not, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was nothing <laughs> no, like that. Maybe, but I, I know, uh, uh, who is it, uh, Lee Child says that he, like, spends days, like, he'll rework the first sentence over and over and over, you know, to, to get it to be just right. I, I don't know. I for me, it's more about the mood I'm establishing in that first page than like, you know, 
getting that sense that really pops. But you know, everyone's different and, and you have to find what stylistic touches work for you.